After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. This is the word of the Lord. Beloved, God has given us his word to build us up and to, to help us to grow in our faith. But sometimes we can read a passage and have a hard time applying it. Actually, in my personal devotional life, uh, I've followed a custom I was taught at a church I attend where I read a section for the day and then I write questions about, you know, that I, I wonder about, I look it up and I write the answers. So I, I do a little Bible study where I teach myself something about it. And then the next section is the hardest section, application. How does this scripture apply? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. And the passage we have before us tonight has often been twisted and misapplied because one number in all of this has a history of being distorted. And that's why I said at the beginning of the service tonight, we're going to start with a little bit of a study before we actually apply the text. One famous cult of a couple million Americans says that the number 144,000 refers to the number of people who actually get to go to heaven. And then there are a lot of millennialist Christian churches that believe that 144,000 must be an exact number. One of the most famous uh, writers on this subject is a man named Hal Lindsey. And he said that he believes the 144,000 will be Jewish evangelists who come out in the last times. So before we even talk about all of this section of Revelation 7 and ask ourselves, what is God telling us? I think we need to look at the subject of prophecy in the book of Revelation and get this number straight in our heads. The Bible contains several different kinds of writings. For example, there are parts of the Bible that are history. The Bible reports history literally. If it says it took three days' journey to go somewhere, then we know they really went that place and it took three days. The Bible also contains doctrine. This has to be clearly presented in words that we can depend on. But the Bible also contains poems and parables and symbolic language. Jesus liked to use parables because he could draw people in and make them think about a point. They think much harder than if he just said it in a single sentence. The point often became the most important thing of anything written in the Bible. To help you understand what we're going to be getting into in a moment, I'd like to make a comparison. Let's compare photographs with paintings. Now each, photographs and paintings each serve a, its own purpose. A photograph is intended to show you what the reality was like. A photograph shows us something exactly, so we can see for ourselves 
what happened. But a painting is different. It tells us what something means. And that's true even of the clear paintings, the, the paintings that uh, you know right away, oh, that's a, that's a Sunday school story. That's the story of the Good Samaritan or whatever. Here we have the kind of painting that some people just really hate, an abstract painting. They say, I can't figure that out. But the key is to understand the artist is not trying to be exact. He's not trying to give you a photograph of what Jesus looked like on the cross. It's very different from what Jesus looked like on the cross. But then, as you look at a painting like this, you study it some more, you see, okay, where did he do something different? One of the most obvious ones, if you can see this close up, is you don't see the, all the blood all over Jesus like you saw in the photograph. So he's showing Jesus in some way glorified, not, not suffering. He's, he's showing Jesus more in a powerful way. We could, we could take this apart and look at it more, but he's certainly on the cross, but there's some things that are different from what it would have been had it been a, a photograph. So there's a message behind the changes, the differences. And now we're going to look at the number 144,000. It's in the Bible. Now, is it the same kind of number as the six days of creation in the history part of Genesis? Or the 40 years in the wilderness that Exodus and Numbers talk about? In other words, is Revelation chapter 7 history? Or is it a message wrapped up in an illustration? Just like I just did with the picture and the, and the, the photograph, let's take a moment to look at different places where we have the lists of the 12 tribes. You maybe can't see very well from a distance, but the first column on your left is the 12 sons of Jacob. So uh, Genesis 35 lists those sons, and it doesn't list them quite in birth order. It lists, first of all, the sons of Leah and of Rachel, the two wives of Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph. Then it lists the sons that were born of the handmaidens of those two women, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Those are the 12 sons that once walked this earth, and we read about them in the book of Genesis. Now, in the book of Numbers, we learn 400 years later about the tribes of Israel. And they're listed there, and they're, there's, you can, again, you maybe can't see it very clearly, but there's a number given. This was like a, a census of the various sizes of the tribes. So Reuben is listed first, Simeon is second. Then you see there's a gap under that, the th where there's a th supposed to be a third name. Levi is not mentioned among the tribes in this list. The reason is, this is a list of the 12 that inherited land, and Levites served at the temple. They had villages all over the country so they could serve as priests, but they, they did not receive a territory of their own, so they're not listed as one of the 12 tribes. Then you go, again, just the same as the sons, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Now you see another blank. And then you see two names in the middle column that aren't in the left column. Those are Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph was given a double inheritance. You remember, he's the oldest son by Rachel. And when Jacob dies, he gives his oldest son by Rachel a double inheritance. So he blesses Jake, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So, so they're counted as two of the 12 tribes in numbers. Then you've got Benjamin, again, in both columns. Then you've got Dan in both columns, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. So there's that thing with Levi, and there's that thing with Joseph. Now, let's go at the list that we just read from Revelation 7. Instead of Reuben being the first one listed, Judah is listed. Now you and I maybe can jump right away to why Judah is so special. This is the tribe from which, in David's line, our Savior Jesus was born. And now he's listed first. Reuben, Sibian. Oh, there's the Levi. Levi's back in the list again in Revelation. 
Then, uh, where Judah would be, of course, is blank. You go to Issachar, Zebulun. Now Joseph is listed again, but Ephraim is not listed, but Manasseh is listed. Now that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Then Benjamin, oh, another missing one. Dan is not there. Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. What is happening here in Revelation 7? Well, for one thing we know, this is not the literal Israel of the Old Testament, is it? It's not the 12 sons, and it's not the 12 tribes. It's a picture. And even the sizes in the middle column, if you could see what I printed out in the screen, there's different sizes of each of the tribes. Some are really strong and have really gotten numerous. Some have gotten pretty tiny already. But in chapter 7, remember what everybody had? We heard it again and again. 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000. These are listed out. The thing about numbers in the book of Revelation is we start seeing patterns. And you heard them even tonight in what we read. God could have said there were, the winds were blowing all over the earth, but instead he said the four corners of the earth and the four winds. Because every time that he talks about earth in the book of Revelation, you're going to see a number four. And every time he talks about God, you're going to see the number three. And when he talks about his people, well, with 12 tribes and 12 apostles, it's no surprise there's 12,000 when it comes to the people. Why the number 1,000? Well, in our English language, in math, you can keep on going, can't you, with naming numbers, but, but in actual regular conversation, what do we say when we want to say the biggest number? We just say a zillion, okay? Well, a thousand in Greek is the zillion number. After, after a thousand, you can have ten thousands, you can have hundred thousands, you can have thousand thousands, but you never, they don't have a word for million. So 12,000 is this huge number of believers. So I laid this all out before you before we looked at the text because I want you to understand. 144,000, that's 12 times 12. 144,000. This huge number of all the followers of God. And that's what it even calls them here. These are God's people that are being sealed, it says. And so tonight, we want to ask ourselves why he waits. The fact is, he waits because he's patient. Revelation tells us this in chapter 7. I once read a book where a man said that God is loving, but he's not all-powerful. According to this author, God can't do everything, and he's not in control of the events of this world. Now, that may sound logical to some people because we say, well, if God loves us, how come this terrible thing happened, right? We, we ourselves puzzle about this mystery, and this guy solved it by saying, well, God can't do everything. He's not almighty. But you yourself know the Christmas story. And in the Christmas story where a virgin conceives and has a child, an angel tells Mary, Nothing is impossible with God. God can do anything. The Bible tells us that as we get close to the end of the world, people are going to get cynical about Christ's return. St. Peter foretold, they will scoff, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But Peter then goes on to explain something that we're seeing here in Revelation 7. Where, where in Revelation 7 it says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Revelation is telling us God is not powerless, God is not unable to help. In fact, what we're seeing right now is he's holding back the destruction that's going to come. He's holding those powers back until the last day. Why? Again, St. Peter in his epistle writes, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
Whenever I study a sermon text and I'm preparing my sermon, I always ask myself this question. So what? Why does this passage of the Bible matter? Why should people who come to church care about what God is saying in the verses I'm preaching on? Now, if you learned from my sermon tonight that 144,000 is not a literal number, then you have not yet found out why these verses are so important. Get over the numbers business and look instead at the angels holding back the destruction of the world that's going to be unleashed at the last day. God is patient with you, Peter tells us, but it will not always be so. The day is coming when the earth will be destroyed and the judgment will fall upon the people of this world. The Bible warns us that on that day, there are people who will be lost. The so what for this passage is that each of us must ask ourselves, am I repentant? The Lord is being patient with me. Have I responded to his patient warning? I sit here in his house I have my guilty thoughts. I look for someone to tell me that I'm all right and that God loves me so I won't have to repent of those things I feel guilty about. But tonight, seeing those angels holding back the forces of destruction, it reminds us that today is the day that we have an opportunity. This may be the last opportunity for one of us. You know what the Lord is talking about in your case. I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit reminds each of us that today is a day for us to put away our sin. As encouragement, Revelation 7 gives us another picture to explain why he waits. He waits because he is setting apart his people. Almost as famous as the 144,000 part of this text is the markings on the foreheads. Boy, again, you talk about the book of Revelation and everybody wants to know, is that going to be a little computer chip that everybody's going to have put in them so that they can't go, do anything, buying or selling or anything like that? That's all people are worried about, buying and selling. They never think about what God might be thinking when he talks about this and what he says here in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 14 and in the New Testament. We see that God wanted something else on people's foreheads, the seal of God. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Again, we come to another so what moment. This is an incredibly comforting picture. And it's not unique to the book of Revelation, even though it occurs twice in Revelation. Just as a cattleman brands his cows to show that they belong to him, so this is a mark that we belong to God. He owns our thoughts. You are a chosen people, Peter wrote, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. When does God set his seal on us? That is, when does he make us his own? At our conversion. For many of us, that happened at our baptism, but it is at whatever time someone becomes a child of God by faith, At that time, God writes his name on our forehead and brands us as belonging to him. Fear not, for I have redeemed you, he writes in the Bible. I have called you by name. You are mine. The sealing of God's people is an ongoing process. It's happening right now in the world. The end is being held off until the process is complete. The New Testament has another passage that says this. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 
Paul also wrote to Timothy, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. Another beautiful assurance about God sealing us is found in the book of Ephesians. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Later in Ephesians, again, the Lord mentions the sealing, saying, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isn't it dumbfounding? You've been counting on your fingers how many passages I quoted that weren't in Revelation that talk about this seal that comes on the foreheads in the book of Revelation. And yet you never hear people talk about this fact, do you? But what a comfort it is to know. We're talking about God saying, these are my people. And he's taking possession of them one after another as they come to faith. How ridiculous it is for people to obsess about wearing some tattoo on your forehead in the last days. The real message that God is getting across is, you belong to me, people. God sets us apart from this evil world and he preserves us. Let it be to the praise of his glory, as Ephesians said just a moment ago. And when someone tries to use the book of Revelation to scare a child of God, these words give us a different picture. The events of this world are unfolding in such a way that God is setting his seal on people. That's motivation to be here, isn't it? Motivation to stay close to the Lord. I saw a humorous thing this week. Somebody sent out, do you remember the old Mama's Family show? Uh, the, the worthless son-in-law says, Mama, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And she says, yeah, you don't have to wear a parachute to jump out of a plane, but it sure helps. And the fact is, when we know what Revelation is saying to us here, that, that the Lord is working to keep us in his family, and that he puts his mark of ownership on us, then it's not too late when we see someone that we know who doesn't believe yet. There's time to reach out. Tonight as we receive the Lord's Supper again, the Spirit is coming to us to strengthen our faith. And as we think about what a blessing it is to be a child of God and be here, let's remember also that there are others who do not have that blessing yet, but that the, the angels are holding back the destruction of the world to give us time to reach them. They're flying over the earth, placing God's seal of ownership on one soul after another. This is why he waits. He waits for you, and he waits for you to tell others. Amen.